Hey everybody, I just want to welcome you to the first episode of a limited series uh, that I'm calling the Midnight Kingdom Lecture Series based on my new book, The Midnight Kingdom, A History of Power, Paranoia, and the Coming Crisis. Um, I wanted to do this series for the same reason that I wanted to write this book in the first place. I have been following the right-wing radicalization of the United States of America uh, for the past six years uh, since I happened across a lot of Donald Trump rallies and spoke with his supporters and realized that something really ugly and gnarly was growing in this country. My last book, American Rule, How Nation Conquered the World But Failed Its People, uh, was a deep dive into American history to understand how American exceptionalism had created this situation and how uh, our, our current circumstances had led to this dangerous new movement. But something else is happening here, and it goes much deeper than midterm elections, presidential elections. It goes a lot deeper than a lot of what the analysis and uh, conversation uh, really gives it credit for and really gets into. Uh, so what I wanted to do here was start outlining some of the basic ideas, themes, and information that is present in the book uh, in order to not just get the word out about this, but also to sort of grow understanding of exactly what we're facing. And this is a lot bigger than Democrat versus Republican, uh, Donald Trump versus Joe Biden. This is a, uh, a, a, an era-defining situation. This is a crisis that uh, is already showing itself to be of tremendous magnitude and danger. And if we're going to get past this, if we're gonna find something better than this and, and, and make a better world, we have to understand how this world was created and start to understand some of the ideas and movements and trends that are underneath the surface. So again, the book is The Midnight Kingdom, A History of Power, Paranoia, and the Coming Crisis. Uh, if you enjoyed this lecture or any of the others, uh, I, I really hope that you will go and pre-order the book. It comes out on January 17th, 2023. But if you want to support my work, if you want to support the book, uh, pre-orders are absolutely essential. So thank you for that. Go ahead and subscribe to this account so you'll get all these lectures. And uh, yeah, let's get into it. So in order to get into what is happening currently in the United States of America and actually around the world as this authoritarian movement gains purchase and power, um, we have to go back to the birth of the modern world. And more particularly, we need to go ahead and start with the moment in which uh, power structures of so-called Western civilization uh, came together and formed a partnership uh, with Christianity to become uh, one of the leading mythologies for how we process the world. And in this, as we're talking about the, these uh, historic moments, I want to point out that ideology, uh, whether it's religious mythologies, political affiliation, uh, a lot of these stories that we tell ourselves, this ideology, which I'm going to continually refer to, is a story. It's the way that we make sense of the world, but also especially how we make sense of our place in the world. So in 27 BCE, the Roman Republic becomes an empire. Now, this is a really important development, particularly not just in terms of how power uh, protects itself and expands itself and also how the mythologies that have created our modern world came about. But it's also important to point out that this is a moment that the extreme right wing, this authoritarian project that we're going to be getting into, this is a moment that they're continually referencing. Uh, they are looking at this moment where democracy suddenly starts to fall apart and it requires something. And, and, and whenever we have discussions about this, they're always going to talk about Caesarism. And Caesarism is this idea that maybe democracy works and maybe these types of governments, maybe they work sometimes, but eventually they degenerate and they decay. And what happens is that in order to save the system from itself, 
you're going to need to bring in a strong man, an authoritarian leader who can go ahead and get rid of all of the red tape and, and get rid of democracy itself and just rule by their own whims alone, untethered by any sort of democratic repercussions. And in this case, the Roman Empire, it becomes a hereditary dynasty. You start seeing leaders chosen, not necessarily because they are the, the strongest or the wisest, but instead because they have a blood link to the previous rulers. This type of hereditary rule is not only something that defined this moment and also the feudal age, which we're going to have to talk about in just a few minutes, but it is also the direct goal of the right-wing authoritarian movement. It is the, uh, the reformation of these hereditary ties in which some people are born of a certain class and other people are born of a different class. And within ancient Rome, this is one of those things that like is continually happening. You're either born into the noble class or you're born into this other class. That other class, which includes poor people, servants, you know, regular people, they are subject to the law. They are the ones who have to be confined by law enforcement and, uh, and by the, the, the dictations of the state. The people who were born of the noble class, they're a different type of person, right? Because they have been born of noble blood. And as a result, they rule on high and all of the processes of the state are there to benefit them and to push things forward. This is something to keep in mind as we get deeper and deeper into this conversation. Now, when you have the beginnings of Christianity, um, and, and, and this is not a religion that was instantaneously the world power that we now know it to be, or one of the defining uh, uh, ideologies that, that creates the uh, consensus reality that we live within. Uh, this was an upstart religion. Of course, it was a, a branching off from the Jewish faith. But in the Roman Empire, Christianity was kind of a problem. And the reason that Christianity is a problem is its, uh, its emphasis on monotheism, or the idea that there is one God. Now, monotheism as an idea in the Roman Empire is disruptive. And one of the reasons it's disruptive is because the Roman Empire, the way that it goes out and conquers and brings new people into the empire, it had always used their gods and their mythologies as sort of a lubricant to make that shift a lot easier. So as a result, anybody can believe in any god, right? There are multitudes of gods. There are gods for seasons. There are gods for chores. There are gods for very specific purposes. The only rule was this. You had to believe in the imperial myth, the myth of Rome as, you know, this bastion of Western civilization, right? You had to believe in Rome and you had to believe in its leaders. And you had to believe that those leaders were somehow or another more exceptional, more powerful, wiser, stronger, you name it, than everybody else. Christianity interrupted that. And from the very moment that Christianity starts to become a force in Rome, it is recognized that this is a destabilizing religion. This is something that can really screw up the processes. It can cause disharmony among the people. And as a result, the Christians are driven underground right? You've probably heard these stories about Christians having to worship in catacombs and in private, right? And in the dark. Just a quick note to go ahead and, and, and put this into your mind, because this is going to come in later when we talk about, I don't know, QAnon. You have to understand that as the Christians were being persecuted and as they were being driven to worship in private, a lot of rumors go around Rome. And these rumors are, you know, the Christians, when they're in the dark, they're engaged in some really awful things, right? They're, they're engaged in uh, bizarre, disturbing sexual practices involving children, right? So you have that link between uh, a lot of the conspiracy theories that we're dealing with now. But you also have this idea that they're not just like abusing children. They're like, they're, they're sacrificing children. They're using their essence for magical purposes. So that mythology, which is going to show back up over and over and over again in these lectures, that is there as Christians are being persecuted. And they make a really, really good target for Roman persecution. 
And there's a reason for that. A lot of people found them incredibly annoying, going around proselytizing, talking about monotheism. But also, the religion of Christianity obviously emphasized martyrdom. So as a result, a lot of Christians are going out looking for martyrdom. They're really, really excited about the idea that they can prove themselves and their faith by either undergoing torture or uh, by, by being killed by the state in the name of their God. But what happens is something really, really strange. And this is a major thing that we have to focus on in these lectures. So when we're talking about ideologies, when we're talking about these myths, what we're talking about are the stories that give us social cohesion. The Roman imperial myth is what gives Rome its power. It's what keeps people going along the same lines. It, it keeps people following the rules. And as long as that myth is, is, is good, as long as people have a strong faith, you know, maybe I want a democratic government, but that strong man, that, that emperor, that person is taking care of things, I can go ahead and go along with that because that myth is still strong. But one of the things that we start to notice, and this is going to be, again, a theme throughout these lectures, and a really important thing to understand why we're going through what we're going through now. Because I want you to go ahead and think about the Roman imperial myth, the idea that Rome is exceptional, that its leaders are exceptional, and that it is fated for some type of major role. That myth starts to fade. And it starts to fade in a lot of ways because of corruption. It starts to fade because hereditary rule and power is just not a good way to do things, right? Like, talent doesn't actually run in the blood or in genetics the same way that, like, the, the, the right wing wants us to believe. Instead, people start to notice the cracks in the Roman imperial myth. They start to understand that maybe these stories that they've been told since their birth Maybe those stories are not true. Now, as this happens, these myths, as they start falling apart, they require an update. Something needs to happen. And I want you to think about modern times, particularly in the United States. We recognize that America is not fair. We recognize that America is not a functioning meritocracy. We understand that our leaders are not the best possible leaders that we could possibly have. Donald Trump did us an incredible favor in showing us that, you know what, a really buffoonish, untalented, unserious person could become president of the United States of America. That starts to go ahead and affect that myth. So what happens is this. Because the Roman imperial myth is losing its power, it needs to update itself. And what happens is as the power structure starts to suffer, it starts to bring in something else that can go ahead and give that flailing myth new life, that it can recharge it. And the Christian myth was absolutely perfect for the Roman power structure for a multitude of reasons. Uh, first of all, the monotheistic thing, because it was originally a problem, it was going to interrupt uh, the, the, this uh, uh, society where you could have all kinds of different gods in conversation with one another. Now, all of a sudden, Rome needs to go ahead and protect itself and exert more and more influence. And as a result, if there's only one god, you need the right god. And if you have a different God, or if you're not part of our system and our reality, well, then we might have to crush you. We might have to conquer you. We might make you come into the empire against your will, right? So monotheism is a really important factor in all of this. But you also have a lot of other things that are taking place. You also have the necessary patriarchal components of Christianity. And of course, this is the idea that the original sin was carried out by Eve, who made Adam eat from the apple of knowledge, and as a result, women should suffer and men need to be the patriarchal leader. That's really useful in Rome, where those types of values are very, very important. 
You also have the stratified ideas. Some people are better than others, and if they have the right God or they have the right values, suddenly they're able to do that. This is a marriage made in hell. And you, you start to have all these civil wars for people like trying to go after power. And in 312 AD, uh, Constantine, who is one of these uh, leaders, one of these warlords battling for power over Rome, Constantine conquers uh, his, his rival. And as he conquers this rival, this myth starts uh, going around, which is before the battle, Constantine sees the Christian cross in the sky. There's other stories that he was actually visited by Jesus Christ himself. And Constantine, uh, supposedly, is so moved by this that eventually he converts to Christianity and eventually Rome itself becomes a Christian state. Now, when this happens and whenever these myths start to intertwine in order to bring people into a new era, something strange about Christianity starts to manifest itself. So Christians, of course, are being persecuted. There's an emphasis on martyrdom. That is how Christianity works when it's outside of power. It also goes ahead and pushes apocalypticism. Now you hear a lot of this, right? When people don't have power, they're going to rely on this apocalypticism, which is, listen, we may not have the votes right now, and tell me if this sounds familiar, we may not have the votes right now, but I have to tell you, what you're doing is angering God. And if you continue to anger God, well, guess what? The country's going to fall apart and we're going to fall into satanic hands, right? Because the Christian mythology says around every single corner, there's the danger of Satan trying to take power from God himself. And sometimes you know that you're helping Satan, and sometimes you don't know you're helping Satan. And luckily, Christians are there with their apocalypticism that says, I cannot prove it right now. I don't have the facts and I don't have power, but I promise you that things are heading in a really dangerous direction. This is something that should sound very, very familiar to anyone who pays attention to American politics right now. But they also have other ideas. And these other ideas are very, very radical and very dangerous, which is that you have to go ahead and conquer the world in order to make it to God's pleasure. And again, in all of this, the ideology that you know what God wants, you know what God thinks, and as a result, you yourself are carrying out what is necessary for God. You become a divine agent or somebody that God pushes power through or his will through. And as a result, and this should be familiar to anybody who paid attention whenever ISIS was running around the Middle East, destroying all these historical sites and monuments and, and, and all these things, the Christians went wild. They were backed by power. And so as a result, they went into all of these temples. They went into all these places where knowledge was stored and science was being carried out. And they went in, they destroyed it. And they murdered the people who, who were doing that. And as a result, that orthodoxy of the Christian myth, you know, you have to follow the tenets of, of this fundamental religion. If you found yourself on the other side of that, suddenly you were a pagan or a barbarian. You were outside of Western civilization. And again, we always have to put quotes around Western civilization because that term itself is really, really loaded and dangerous. So then, because we've moved into this monotheistic religion mythology propping up the power of Rome, you have Romans, or the people of Western civilization. They deserve better, right? They deserve resources, they deserve protection, they deserve dignity. But if you're a pagan, or if you're a barbarian, you get what's coming to you. And whenever we start going into this idea of this mythology of the religion propping up the power of the state or just power structures in general, that always happens. Somebody has to suffer because orthodoxy has to be carried out. Now, before we get into the fall of Rome, I have to introduce you to a really important figure in all of this. And that is St. Augustine, the Bishop of Hippo. And St. Augustine is one of the uh, most influential leaders of the church. Augustine sits around a lot with uh, ethical and philosophical sort of rumblings of the church. 
And one of the things that St. Augustine starts to push is, again, something that, that goes back to the monotheistic orthodox structure of the Christian myth propping up this power structure. And that is the idea of righteous and unrighteous persecution. Now, again, I want you to go ahead and as we're talking about the past, I want you to keep your 21st century mindset. And tell me if this sounds familiar. Righteous persecution is anything that the righteous do. If you have the capital T truth of God on your side and you are carrying out God's will, which by the way, like you can just use force to prove that, like you don't have to necessarily convince anyone. If you have truth on your side, mistreatment of others, particularly people who do not have truth on their side or God on their side, maybe they're even wicked, maybe they're even satanic, maybe they're just mo you moving against God's will. Anything you do to them is technically righteous. It's the right thing because you're trying to spread the truth. You're trying to literally save people from themselves. This is an important idea that we have to remember when you think about, I don't know, rolling back abortion rights, when you think about going after gay and trans people, when you're talking about using the power of the state to oppress people and exploit people. The idea here is the same. I have God on my side, and as a result, I can do whatever I want to you because technically I'm doing it for the right reasons. An unrighteous persecution, you guessed it, it's anything that's done against the church. And this sets up the power structure. You follow the orthodoxy of the church, you follow the direction of the church, and that's it. Those are the only options. Everything else can possibly lead to death, persecution, and just any amount of, of absolute horrors. So we're going to jump forward a little bit and we're going to talk and that's in 410 AD. And this is after the power structure of, of the Roman imperial myth has been imbued with that Christian mythology. And here's the thing. Rome goes down, the, the, the actual structure, it starts to go down in, in the 5th century. And from there, the empire starts to fall apart. So here's the thing. If this empire, which was the first Christian empire, if it enjoyed the support and the will of God, the question becomes, how in the world could that empire with the backing of God ever fall? And so you start to see this spreading of philosophy, which is the world is so wicked, we have to survive. And by we, I mean the Catholic Church, the Christian religion, has to survive beyond the fall of Rome. And it needs to move out into the world. We need to prepare the world for God. We need to defeat Satan. We need to defeat all of the evil that is out in the world that makes it possible for something like the Roman Empire to fall. This must have been God's will. And so as a result, we have to follow God's will. Now, one of the things that happens in all of this is because the Roman Empire had become the defining empire in Western civilization. It was the gravity of that world. As that falls and as that influence starts to wane, and again, keep your mind on the present as we're talking about the past. Right now, the defining empire in the world is the American empire. It's currently in decline. It's currently losing power. So as that starts to lose power, it erupts into a chaos. Uh, all of a sudden, you, uh, you, you have a loss of a standard of living. All of a sudden, you start to see violence all over the place, which is largely unregulated. You know, and, and, and when you're starting to watch like this age of like disparate kingdoms and tribes fighting against one another, the one constant in all of it, the one uniting gravity is the Christian church and the Christian ideology, which maintains its stranglehold over Western civilization and also continues to hold the mantle of Rome. That idea literally becomes secondary to the idea of the Christian church. So as this happens, as, as all of a sudden chaos is breaking out, 
you still need to maintain some sort of an ideology that makes sense of the world. And that's what the Christian church was supplying to all of these sort of aspiring rulers. You have a lot of warlords who are going throughout the country. They're uniting peoples. They're conquering others. They're killing people left and right. You need some type of an orthodoxy, right? You need some kind of a story, some sort of an ideology that goes ahead and says, we're on the right side, they're on the wrong side, and as a result, everything that we do to them is righteous. Everything is good because we're doing it on behalf of a benevolent God who wants us to do this. And as this happens, the Catholic Church, the Christian Church, it takes the authority of the Roman Empire, which is Western civilization, and it starts bestowing that authority onto people below them. And this is how you start to see popes and leaders start to grant monarchs the power to rule over empires and kingdoms. So as a result, when they're placing the crown or when they're doing the coronation, what they're literally doing is they are saying, God wills this, you have the authority of God, and you also are carrying on the tradition of Western civilization. Now, as this is happening, we're also making sense of the world. And the way that we're making sense of the world is through this idea of the chain of being. This strict hierarchy that is enforced by the church, it orders things. It says, obviously, at the top of the universe is God himself. And as we move down from uh, the, the chain of command, as it were, the heavenly chain of command, you have God, then you have the angels, then you have the church, you have kings, and then you have nobles, and then you have peasants. And what this does is it goes ahead and it reinforces this idea that the hierarchy is not just necessary, but it's God's will. God has personally ordered the universe to make sure that there are some people at the top of this chain who are more powerful than others. So as a result, the people down below, these peasants, well, they deserve what they get, whether or not that's being subject to cruelty and exploitation. But also, they shouldn't expect to move up in ranks, right? They weren't born noble. They're not part of the monarchy. As a result, they should just settle for whatever they get and be happy to get it. Now, this system is structured in a very interesting way. So beneath the king, of course, you have nobles, you have knights, and then you have peasants. And this entire system, the way that it is structured and ordered, is that you swear on a Bible or you swear on God's word, right? It's, 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 we still have these leftover parts of this in our world. And so basically it says, you have to follow these contracts. You have to work for me. You have to follow my orders and you have to uh, promise your soul to God. And if you don't do that, well, guess what? There are consequences. And here's the idea behind this. And this is going to be very, very important. So please remember this. In the feudal society, where you have a bunch of peasants who are literally just like harvesting enough crops and, and resources in order to make it through the year, there's not a promise of anything getting better. There's no goal down the line. There's no making the world better. The only thing that you can do is be wary of Satan and evil. Basically, because this hierarchy is intact, you're told your reward for your duty and your fealty, it's not on this planet, right? It's in heaven. And if you go ahead and play by the rules, and if you go ahead and follow the orders of your betters, the people that God has placed above you on the chain of being, well, maybe you'll see heaven. And maybe that will be a reward for all of your toil and all of your suffering. Now, when we leave the feudal era, which we're going to do in just a minute, things start to change. And that's a really, really, really important thing that we're going to have to keep in mind as we're starting to analyze what's happening in our current climate. So within this relationship, within this chain of being, there's a couple of things that we need to talk about very quickly in terms of what these groups do and what parts they serve, right? So the church as this holder of authority, as the 
as the engine of, 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 of meaning here, right? So the church, of course, is taking care of installing belief and faith, which means, you know, they're teaching the people to go ahead and, and, and do what their betters want them to do because that chain of being is very, very important. And, and all this time, things like literacy, not very important. They're not, it's not very high up there. You just need to listen to what your betters tell you. In exchange for this, installing the belief and faith in the system, they go ahead and they get resources from the, the nobles, from the kings and the queens. They go ahead and basically get a kickback in all of this. And at the same time, they also get protection right? They're not going to be roughed up. They're not going to have their churches burned down. They're not going to be slaughtered. At the exact same time, what they're getting is administrative orthodoxy. So in all of this, the state, the burgeoning state, the kings, the nobles, the knights, they're making sure that anybody who starts to question the Christian church's mythology, whether you have a different interpretation of who God and Christ and the Holy Spirit are, or maybe you don't believe in that, maybe you're an atheist, maybe you're a secret pagan. If you have any problem with the Christian mythology, the Christian church is working with the state to carry out administrative orthodoxy. This takes the shape of, of inquisitions, right? This, this makes sure that there are major investigations in people. And sometimes those people, they have all of their things taken away. Sometimes they're tortured. Sometimes they're killed. Sometimes their entire existence is wiped off the face of the earth. And so as a result, that fealty to the church is protected and it continues to move forward. Now, in terms of the secular powers, what they're getting out of this is they are getting support for power. As you're being taught about Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit, it's also being drilled into you that this chain of being is in place. And as a result, the people who are above you on the chain of being, they're, they're imbued with the authority of God. Don't question them. Don't revolt. Don't push back against them. And if you do push back, well, guess what? Hell is waiting for you and the reward of heaven isn't possible. What we also get is the legitimizing of power and conquer. In all of this, and, and, and as these feudal states are starting to gain more and more power and influence, they start looking at other countries and other peoples, and they start thinking about conquering them and going over and plundering their resources. So as we're talking about colonization, as we're talking about slavery, what happens is a really insidious thing. The church starts saying, you know what? God wants you to invade other countries. God wants you to enslave people. God wants you to carry out genocides. It's what he wants from you. So as a result, you're being given nations that already exist. You're being given dominion over other people. So in this concert, you go out and every time you show up on one of these new countries, or one of these new locations that you're gonna go ahead and conquer and exploit, you're carrying that cross with you and you better believe you're bringing some priests with you because you need to go ahead and legitimize all of this conquering and all of this cruelty through the Christian church, which is more than happy to send its missionaries into these places to go ahead and make sure that that administrative orthodoxy is being carried out against colonized people. Let's talk about what happens and how the modern world was created. The administrative functions require education. In order to go ahead and record keep everything from what you're getting from other countries through colonization to going around and carrying out inquisitions in which you're torturing and punishing and imprisoning and killing, you got to get some skills for that. 
So as that starts to take place, and as the nation state starts to really become like a, uh, a rival for the church, which by the way, that's another important part of this. We always have to focus on what is the defining idea of the moment, right? Is it the church over the nation states or is it the nation states over the church? We're at another moment right now in which that order is being challenged and it's starting to change. And every time that that happens, it leads to crises. It leads to violence, as we're going to see. But as they're getting this education, as these nation states are starting to like get history training or they're starting to gain more and more literacy, they start realizing something a little disturbing. They start realizing that the church has lied to them. They start realizing that the church has manipulated them. And they've done that in order to contain their power and, and to maintain their influence over the nation states. So all of a sudden, what happens? The nation states push back. Now, one of the more interesting moments in all of this, in, in 1303, you actually have like a, a, a Pope Boniface the, the Eighth, And B Boniface is just a wild Pope who is just like absolutely going off. And like he ends up in a rival with Philip, the King of France. And eventually, you know, in, in the past, like your authority rested on the church, right? Will the church protect my authority to be king, to be the leader on this chain of being? Well, eventually they get tired of this. And eventually Philip's just like, I am done with this Pope. Go and rough him up, grab him from, uh, from his bedroom, and, and take him prisoner. And eventually what you start to see is that, again, the nation state starts to grow beyond the church. And as this happens, there's all of a sudden a lot of really strange things that start taking place. Because, again, remember that this idea of the Christian mythology... Being the main ideology or myth that determines reality, this starts changing. And all of a sudden, the nation state starts becoming the center of gravity in the world as these empires are starting to grow and gain more and more influence. So all of a sudden, the Christian mythology becomes secondary to the nation state. And you better damn well believe that this, another apocryphal moment in which the major structuring, orthodoxy, and mythology starts to change, you better believe that that leads to some chaos. So as the nation state starts to become the defining mythology, we have this thing, the Protestant Reformation. This is another thing that we're going to pay attention to as we go through history. As the Protestant uh, Reformation happens, and everybody knows the story about Martin Luther, uh, this is where, of course, Luther puts his theses on the church door. This takes place because of a multitude of reasons, right? So we have Martin Luther that says, you know what, the corruption of the Catholic Church is too much, we need a change. Which in the past, by the way, would have gotten you killed almost immediately except for a couple of things are very important at this moment. Of course, we have the rise of the nation state. And because the church was seen as like an international order, as the nation states start to gain power and purchase and they're competing against one another, that doesn't really work for them. They kind of want to move beyond this. All of a sudden, they want to start having their own power of religion in order to protect their power, right? And as the nation state is, is making all this sort of like shuffled up, we also have another invention, the printing press. And as the printing press starts to change the world, it starts to change the mythology of the world and how, how, it's, uh, how it's seen, how it's perceived, how it's carried out. And this is another major theme in all of this, which is when we have major innovations in technology, and I want you to think about social media. I want you to think about the internet. 
those are moments where that old mythology starts to flicker and a new era is suddenly possible. And, and to determine that new era, people have to do things. They have to propose new ideas, new structuring thoughts, which is exactly what the right wing is doing right now. And before we move forward and talk about what came from this, we need to acknowledge that their idea is more or less to bring everyone back to a feudal hereditary system, the likes of which that this is trying to escape. It's literally about getting rid of things like representative democracy, which we'll talk about in a second, and it's about going back to unchallenged, untethered power. Those old hierarchies that served everyone so well, whenever people, they didn't have any sort of uh, reward on earth, they had to hope that maybe they would get something in heaven. And they're trying to bring back the structure in which the church was unquestioned before all hell broke loose. From the Protestant Reformation and this schism between the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church, uh, things don't go great. Uh, because this is the uniting mythology that sort of underlines all of the nation states and all of those power structures that are in place during the feudal uh, era. It leads to 8 million people being killed. We're talking world wars. We're talking just slaughters in the street. You think you have God on your side. I think I have God on my side. We're talking absolute holy war. And when you see that happen, you start to realize, you know, this might not be the best way to structure things. This might not be the best way to have a world because it's going to lead to slaughter, because there's going to be uh, righteous persecution, because you're going to need violence and you're going to need control in order to keep people doing what you want them to do, to keep them showing up at work. And this is actually part of the problem with the feudal era in which, and tell me if this sounds familiar, a pandemic, the Black Death, ravages Europe. People look around and all of a sudden they're like, why isn't anyone taking care of me? Why are the, the, the authorities taking care of me? Why in the hell isn't the church taking care of this if, if, if this is all about God's wrath? And all of a sudden, after all of these people die, and after you have all these wars, people are like, man, I don't want to hang around in this feudal state anymore. That deal doesn't really work for me. Maybe I can go elsewhere and I'll get better treatment. Exactly. Keep that in mind about the present day in which the labor status that we're, we're currently uh, uh, having and, and the fact that like all of these interest rates are about, you know, reinstalling discipline in the workers. So people start going to the cities where the church doesn't necessarily have the sway. They get away from these feudal lands and we start having a strange moment. We start again moving up to an apocal moment in which feudalism is going to give way to capitalism. But we'll get there in just a second. Because right now, we need to go ahead and talk about the Enlightenment and what it represents. The Enlightenment is a movement that results from the rejection of the church's rule and the old power structures. And what happens is we have a group of people, learned, educated, wealthy people. They start to have an emphasis on logic, and empirical evidence. Don't talk to me about visions. Don't talk to me about apocalypticism. Show me facts. Show me figures. And these people who are getting educated, they start to say, you know what? I really do not care for, you know, these millions of people being slaughtered. I don't think this is a good way to run a government or a society. But again, the church is still powerful, right? The nation state is still enforcing orthodoxy. So to come out and say that, to come out and say, you know, I don't think the church is right, and maybe I don't even agree with their views, that can still lead to you having everything taken away. It can lead to an inquisition type situation. It can lead to you being imprisoned, your family being harassed, or you literally being killed. So all of these enlightenment figures, these educated, uh, uh, privileged people who aren't, you know, up in the monarchy and, and maybe aren't even up in the nobility, they all of a sudden, they start mailing one another and they start communicating and they start comparing notes. And as they do, they're pushing science, but they're also pushing philosophy and politics. Another place where they start finding themselves and they start organizing is in secret societies. 
And, and when we're talking about that, and again, like I, I'm, I'm sure as you're hearing this, your antennas are, are raising a little bit, and they should be. We have these enlightened individuals who want to push back against the church's mythology and the state's mythology. They want to change things. And so as a result, they go into secret societies like the Freemasons or the Illuminati for just a very brief moment. And when they go into these places, they're gaining trust with each other. You have to go through these rituals. You have to go through this process where you're like moving through levels. And each level that you go through proves you can be trusted. And as it does, it starts to talk about the lies that the church has peddled in order to maintain power and control. So while you're in these groups, the Freemasons, the Illuminati, you're starting to develop an idea for a secular state. And this would be, again, a total rejection of the idea that all facets of society should be run by the church in, in agreement with the state. Because as we've seen, millions of people die that way. It leads to chaos and war and suffering and the suppression of information. Now, that doesn't mean that they want to destroy the church. Keep that in mind because this is going to get us to where we're going and also help define our modern moment. Every time you hear a Republican or a right-wing personality or whatever talk about the war against Christianity or the war on God or conspiracies to take down the church, they're talking about this and they're talking about what we're getting ready to discuss. Now, as we were talking about the orders of society, the feudal order, it tells you reward in heaven. And of course, you can't get to heaven unless you die. You have to have a life here that is good and holy and, 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 and smiled upon by God in order to get your just reward for all of your hard work and, and all the things that you've gone through. But what we start to see in the developing capitalist, enlightened world is this. You can have a utopia or a heaven on earth. If we can get the Christian church off our backs, if we can get away from hereditary rule by kings and queens and nobles, if somehow or another we can escape this society, we can focus on science. We can focus on progress. We can perfect government and we can perfect society. And that idea becomes its own secular faith. If we can just gain power, if we can just gain control. And by the way, we're going to start talking about capitalism here in just a minute. If we can create a system that rewards the worthy, the meritocracy, right? Only the best are going are gonna to rise up to the top. It's literally going to destroy the chain of being. And it's going to replace it with the meritocracy. And this, this entire idea is how you reach the age of revolutions. And first and foremost, we're going to go ahead and we're going to talk about the American Revolution. And... You know, the mythology, and I talked about this a little bit in American Rule, the mythology is everybody just got up one day and they were like, man, screw Britain. We're so tired of this. Freedom was rippling through the world. Uh, uh, and, and, and there was just a fire in the heart of, of the American people. And that's not true. Uh, the revolution was only supported by about 30% of the population, give or take. And on top of that, the support that was there, a lot of it was cultivated through the normal channels. It went through the churches, which, uh, you know, these enlightened individuals, the founding fathers, that they inspired, they used uh, a religion for their own purposes in order to, again, create their own myth. But it also took place with newspapers. And this is the printing press. Again, it allows this big, massive change as the new technology holds sway over people. So here's the thing. The American Revolution wasn't just a spontaneous universal revolution. It was a bourgeois revolution. It was a revolution of a moneyed, privileged class that happened to be underneath the nobility and the monarchy. 
And they said, we're done with this. We're tired of taking uh, uh, orders from you. We're tired of you stepping on our toes and telling us what to do with our businesses and our wealth and getting a cut off the top. So when we talk about the American Revolution, it's not a full-scale revolution. We're talking about the elites of the society creating the conditions to move away from the monarchy, to go ahead and reject the old feudal order, and to go ahead and create a new society based on enlightened ideas and principles. And the fact that they beat out Great Britain is part of a larger trend that will start showing itself, which is this movement away from feudalism. But make no mistake about it, this was very, very specifically done by a group of wealthy individuals who wanted to get away and out from underneath the thumb of hereditary rule that was made possible through Christian mythology. So as a result, what do we do? We have the Christian nation state, that mythology, we're gonna ship that over. We're gonna move to a capitalism and liberalism. That's capital L liberalism, by the way. And we need to talk about what liberalism is. Because in the United States of America, unfortunately, to much of our detriment, we've lost track of what words mean and what these labels actually mean. We're not talking about liberals in the Democratic Party here. We're talking about a larger uh, epoch-defining ideology that is currently, and by the way, this right here, this is the essence, this is the heart of the battle that we find ourselves in now. And we'll talk more about this as this series goes forward. But make no mistake, this right here, this is a battle that has been raging since the 18th century. It happens to be reaching a much, much bigger showdown right now, which is one of the reasons that we're all in a lot of trouble, and we better change some things fast before it gets out of hand. When we're talking about liberalism, we're talking about a couple of things here. It is the destruction of that old Christian feudal order, right? So we're replacing the chain of being, which by the way is a caste system, with a meritocracy. Instead of saying God has chosen winners and losers and that's the end of it, you can never possibly have a better position in life, we're going to go ahead and bring in capitalism. And capitalism, and remember, by the way, that in feudalism, you were just making sure that you had enough resources to make it through the winter, right? In capitalism, we're taking excess resources. That's the main purpose in all of this, is it's making sure we can go ahead and take excess and make money off of that, and it will create its own system. So as a result, instead of relying on God's will to choose winners and losers, we're going to use a market, which supposedly, by the way, is going to be uh, unbiased, right? The invisible hand that makes sure that all this stuff works. Uh, we'll talk in a second about why all of that is absolute and utter horseshit, but that's neither here nor there. While we're doing that, we're going to go ahead and replace God as the control to the law. There's a reason why America was founded with the separation of church and state. It goes back to the wars of religion. It goes back to the destruction of, uh, of hereditary uh, uh, power. To get God out of secular events, and this is one of the things that everybody wants as they're going to Freemason meetings, as they're going to Illuminati meetings, as they're talking amongst themselves. It's not that they want to destroy God. It's not that they want to get rid of that, those ideas. Some of them did. And there were some people who were absolutely radical atheists who wanted to push back against any of these powers. But for the most part, they want to make the main organizing principle unbiased law. And that law will go ahead and take the place of spiritual control. Now, with this, and again, this is liberalism, right? 
one of the main purposes of liberalism and one of the main defining factors of it is an emphasis on property, which is the idea that freedom derives from the ability to protect your property. Now, when they're talking about this, they're not just talking about, I don't know, a white marker board or a house. They're talking about all kinds of things. They're talking about, you know, land. They're talking about their businesses, their industry. And you guessed it, they're also talking about slaves. Because part of what liberalism hides, and this is through a lot of its own mythology, liberalism was never meant to create a world in which everybody would be equal. Liberalism was about taking power away from uh, the church, from kings and queens, the monarchy, and the nobility, and bringing it down to the bourgeois, which are going to be middle class to upper class wealthy people. And there's a reason the United States is founded the way that it is, that the Constitution is written the way that it is, because it is written specifically in order to benefit and protect a small minority of wealthy white men. And as a result, our government was created in order to keep in power a minoritarian uh, small group of wealthy, powerful white men. Uh, it was made to ensure that slavery would go forward. Uh, of course, you know, we can't look at uh, enslaved people as actual people. And it was also done to keep women away from power as well as the poor. It was created specifically in order to be a one party they didn't want to be called a party. They thought that the ruling class, the, the bourgeois, would be able to work within itself. Um, by the way, just a quick little side note. By 1800, the election of 1800 suddenly started having two parties. And immediately the Federalists are saying, you know what, Thomas Jefferson, I believe he's trying to destroy America and the church. He's part of the Illuminati conspiracy. It only lasted a few years, that, that ruling class sort of uh, consensus. But as they're putting together all of these things, they're talking about freedom and liberty and all of that, but they have created a system in order to protect themselves. So what are we looking at here? We're looking at a still unequal society, and that still unequal society has just moved power down a couple of rungs. And we have all of these purposes that are in place that maybe this will create a new system while keeping you know, some of the hierarchy in place while replacing the larger hierarchy and the last mythology with something new. A quick word on capitalism. So capitalism, again, is a system in which we're told that you know, it will go ahead and it'll sort the winners from the losers, the talented from the untalented. It will go ahead and create a meritocracy, which will create its own hierarchy, right? But there's a couple of things that people don't like to talk about. First of all, it launders all of the money that was made during the previous era, including through colonization and through slavery. So by the time the United States is founded, you still need a stratified system right? You have white, wealthy men. How did they get their wealth? Well, sure, some of them earned it, but most of them were just going ahead and profiting off of these old ideas, including colonialism, exploitation, and slavery. So as a result, it just takes everybody who has benefited from that cruelty and unequal system and says, okay, now the race is on, everything's fair, no excuses now. They were given such a head start ahead of everybody else. And basically, it just took all of those absolutely awful atrocities and just turned it into something else. It literally was money laundering and cruelty laundering. And the idea that a meritocracy existed is complete and utter shit, right? The people who were there at the top were going to continue being at the top. Now, we also had this idea of the invisible hand. And it's not a coincidence, by the way, that Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations comes out in 1776 as the American Revolution is taking place. The American Revolution is made possible because of the rise of capitalism overthrowing the feudal system. Now, Adam Smith has this idea that all of these capitalists like to point at and, and, and constantly repeat, which is the idea 
that capitalism works because it works upon people's self-interest. And this is an old holdover from the feudal state, which said, you know, original sin is the defining thing about humanity. You can't trust them. They're wicked. They're fallen. The capitalist system says, you know what, people, they're very selfish. And as a result, we have to harness, harness that selfishness. And so as a result, the way the system works is by prioritizing selfishness. You don't have to worry about other people. Try and help yourself. Try and amass your own wealth. And as a result, society will get better. And maybe if you are selfish enough, we will reach that utopic moment with heaven on earth. But here's the thing that nobody likes to talk about, particularly capitalists, which is Adam Smith did say that the invisible hand would make sure that selfish actions would make society better. But if you read further in Wealth of Nations, all of a sudden Adam Smith starts sounding some warnings. He starts telling you that unregulated capitalism is really dangerous. And if you take a system based on selfish self-interest, well, the wealthy might in, get involved in conspiracies against the people. They might go ahead and overtake the capitalist system and make sure that it doesn't really work as a meritocracy anymore. Adam Smith, the definer of capitalism, is the first person to sound the alarm, which is, hey, this might get out of control if somebody doesn't regulate this thing. And by the way, keep that in mind as we're talking about the present crisis, because shocker of shockers, this emphasis on the invisible hand and selfishness as the only means of, of, of ordering things, it has led to capitalism getting out of hand. It has led to conspiracies against the public. And you sure as hell bet that it has led to one crisis after another, including the one that we're facing right now. I want to take a quick moment before we wrap this thing up. I don't want to talk really, really quickly about Edmund Burke. And Edmund Burke was a uh, highly, highly influential and powerful politician in uh, England. And actually, Burke was really supportive of the American Revolution. He looked at, at the Americans and he said, you know, that's us. That's, that's the British who are showing like this desire for freedom. So he actually looked for peace. He actually looked for trying to solve the problems with the, uh, the colonists in order to, to bring about harmony. And at the same time that this is happening, Edmund Burke is fighting his own war in Britain. Um, he, he, he starts to uh, go after this guy named Warren Hastings. And Warren Hastings is the director of East India Corporation uh, uh, Actions in India. And East India Company, by the way, is like one of the first corporations. And it was created by the nation state to go ahead and exert its influence on other peoples. You know, we're here, right, in England. They're over there. We need to go over there. And as a result, we have to exert power and control. So when you do that, the corporation is imbued with all the powers of the state, including the ability to wage war and enforce laws. And so what happens, and, and people like Hastings are part of this, and Edmund Burke absolutely hates it, you go over to these countries and you gain a lot of wealth and a lot of influence, and then you come back into the country and you corrupt the politics. This is something else that, you know, you, you look at Adam Smith's warning, you start realizing these are cycles. Corporations go out into the world they make a ton of money, particularly as they're carrying out the business of empire, such as the American empire. And then all of a sudden they have a lot of excess wealth. And what do they do with it? They start buying off politics. They start buying off politicians. They start corrupting the system. And Edmund Burke was going after Warren Hastings and saying, this is a millstone around our necks. It's going to destroy England. He was right about that. He was right about how damaging that was and how dangerous it was. But something else then happens. The French Revolution breaks out across the channel and Edmund Burke is suddenly absolutely terrified. He sees what's happening in France with the execution of a king, with uh, you know what he sees as mass anarchy. And he says, this is incredibly dangerous. And as he says that, Burke starts throwing around this idea that there needs to be an emphasis on tradition. That maybe old ideas, whether it's religion or a hierarchy that, that relies on something like the chain of being, 
These things are important. And instead of changing everything, we should go ahead and look at the past, look at what has worked for some people, obviously, white wealthy men. And we should go ahead and try and stop like haphazard ideas from taking off and, and, and unless they cause total anarchy and bloodshed. In this way, Edmund Burke founds the current and, 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 and overwhelming ideology of conservatism, right? Whenever you hear Republicans talk about, what about family values? What about traditions? Edmund Burke is always at the center of that. And his backlash against the French Revolution is seen as the birth of the battle between liberalism versus conservatism. Which we'll talk about more and more as we go forward, because this is the defining battle and what we're dealing with currently. So, as Burke is trying to push back against liberalism, which has become the consensus of the world, representative democracy, individual rights and freedoms, property, you name it, this new meritocracy based on capitalism. Here's the thing. Burke wasn't just politically opposed to this. You know, we can go ahead and have a conversation about like what is good about conservatism or maybe sometimes you do need to consider what you're doing before you do it. These are these are arguments that can be made. But to sit here and pretend that conservatism was just like a not dangerous, weird, radical ideology, it's to hide history. And by the way, whenever people try and tell you the Republican Party was perfectly fine before Donald Trump, an eccentric, buffoonish, you know, reality TV star showed up, what they're doing is they're trying to not talk about what we're getting ready to talk about, which is that Edmund Burke believed that there was a, a massive conspiracy against Christianity, and he wasn't the only one who believed that. What Edmund Burke believed was a conspiracy theory that was being peddled by right-wing, particularly church-affiliated figures. Uh, one of the most famous ones was a guy named Augustine Burrell, and uh, he published uh, Illustrated History of Jacobinism, which tried to explain what was going on in France. And here's the idea. This idea is that the Freemasons... And the Illuminati and evil forces, satanic if you want, were coming together to seed revolution in order to overthrow Christianity and enslave the world. Does that sound familiar? Because it should. This is the entire right-wing conspiracy, which we'll break down in just a couple of minutes. Augustine Burrell puts this out there. A bunch of other right-wing church-affiliated people put this out there. Edmund Burke loves it. Edmund Burke absolutely believes that this is what is happening and that the revolution in France and possibly even in America, which he supported, that all of that is about overthrowing Christianity and enslaving the world and creating, again, going back to a Christian religion, an apocalyptic scenario in which people are going to be enslaved and destroyed and everything that's good about the world will be destroyed. This is the root of conservatism. It's not just Donald Trump. It's not just Alex Jones. It's not any of those people that are driving this. This is the absolute root of conservative ideology. And why? Because their power and their wealth is protected believing this. This is the ideology that rationalizes everything that they do. So how do you fight the conspiracy? By right-wing measures. So first off, and by the way, all of this is going to be really familiar, right? And I, I'm telling you, always keep an eye on the 21st century modern times as we're going into the past. So how do we do this? Law enforcement. 
In addition to going after fugitive slaves, the beginning of law enforcement in a large part is about going after revolutionaries or leftists, people who could possibly be a part of this conspiracy to overthrow the crown, to overthrow the hierarchy, to overthrow the Christian church, right? You got to get police out there. And you better believe that they're going out there arresting people, questioning people, and harassing people. You're also going to need intelligence services. And as the revolution is playing out in France, all of a sudden you start having networks of spies. You start having these English people who are going about spying on people, getting information, right? This is, of course, a precursor to things like the Central Intelligence Agency or the FBI, because the entire idea is that there is an evil, wicked threat and matter of fact, some of the people who are part of it don't even know that they're part of it. They don't even know the secrets, right, that are held by the Freemasons and the Illuminati. So you need intelligence services to make sure that any potential threat is put down. You ready for this? Because it's about to get real. You need to control immigration. As France is descending into bloodshed and chaos, People are streaming over to Great Britain, looking for hope, looking for a place that they can be safe. Burke and everyone else, they see this as an incredible danger. Are they secretly revolutionaries who are coming across our border in order to spread dangerous ideas? Are they coming over here to become a fifth column that we're going to have to fight? Are they trying to replace our population? Keep that in mind this is going to be incredibly important as we're talking about the current crisis. And what ends up happening with all of this is we have the creation of a defining mythology for the right wing. And this is how it works. It's the idea that at all times, their pursuit of protecting their power and their wealth, their status in life, their rightful status, which is what they believe, they think that they are facing a major evil conspiracy. It's still Freemasons, Illuminati, throw in Jewish people in there, you know, uh, and then on top of it, still evil forces, Satan, all, all kinds of those things. And the idea is this, and it's important because it goes along with the nation state. The nation state is sovereign. It needs to be protected as well as its traditions, as well as its historic ideas, right? It's identity. Too many people come in, first of all, you'll go ahead and dilute that identity, which is why you need immigration control. But also, outside of the country, you have people who are plotting against you. The Freemasons, the Illuminati, the Jews, satanic forces. They're plotting against the country and they will do anything to destroy the country and to destroy the Christian religion and to overthrow everything about the world and, and enslave it and, and carry out this apocalyptic plan. Things would be fine. They could be thwarted. But you've got traitors on the inside. Liberals. Liberals are traitors to the right wing because they're fine welcoming people in. They're fine having this discourse. They are traitors against the nation and they have to be treated as such. And then you have the people who, to the right wing, who believe in this rightful hierarchy that they are better than other people and that you're born either, uh, either good or bad or you're born smart and talented or you're incompetent and you're, you're in need of someone above you. Those people can be manipulated. They can't be trusted, and as a result, democracy is incredibly dangerous. It's a weakness that has to be overcome. And we're going to talk more about that, and we're going to develop that out. But here is what we have seen. Since the 18th century, with the age of revolution, since the birth of liberalism, in which a bourgeois group of white wealthy men believe that they know better, that a controlled representative government is necessary, and where capitalism is this defining force that has taken over from the old feudal order, that liberalism is now in an ideological war against the conservatism that Edmund Burke and others put forward, which says that liberalism itself is an evil conspiracy 
And democracy itself is a weakness that goes ahead and makes sure that the rightful rulers of the world are not allowed to rule the world. Our modern crisis, which we're going to talk more about in our next episode and in all future episodes, the modern crisis of the world is an apocalyptic showdown between capital L liberalism and capital C conservatism. These ideas are still playing out, and this is about trying to rewind the clock, which the Republican Party and other right-wing authoritarian movements are currently carrying out through the stolen Supreme Court, through attacks on democracy, through the, the creation of an authoritarian movement. They are trying to roll back the clock. They are trying to get to a time before liberalism and before capitalism, well, they'll probably still have capitalism. That's an interesting thing that we're going to talk about in a later episode. But trying to get back to a point where the chain of being wasn't broken, where there were rightful rulers who ruled simply because they had the right blood, because they were from the right family, because they were from the right stock. They've seen everything that has happened since then through the developments of liberalism and the progress that has come with those ideas, even though that progress hasn't moved far, further enough and it hasn't done enough, they want to roll that back because they see it as a mistake. And right now, currently, we are looking at things like liberal democracy, our ability to vote and have representatives and a say in our lives. That's all on the chopping block. Those are the stakes, literally. And we'll get more into the history of it and more into the details. But I just want to say, first of all, thank you again for tuning into this. Um, if you enjoyed this, subscribe to this account. Go and pre-order The Midnight Kingdom, The History of Power, Paranoia, and the Coming Crisis. Uh, and also, tell some people about this. You know, send them this video. Let them know that uh, we're having this discussion. Because uh, this is something that everybody needs to know about. And coverage and analysis of our current moment, it is... Um, woefully inadequate. I'll just put it that way. All right. Thanks. Until next time, episode two of the Midnight Lecture Series. Take care.